Welcome to a presentation covering Chapter 5 of our textbook. Um, here we go, I'm having some technical difficulty. Here we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so we'll be talking about the court system and ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. Um, a couple of uh, things to get started with, I guess it's sort of an introduction. We have a pretty complex court system in our country. Um, that is due to our federalist system. In most areas, we've got a federal solution to the problem of of level of government and a state solution. So we literally have 52 courts. In fact, we have more than 52 court systems in our country. Each state has its own court system. Then, of course, the District of Columbia has a court system, and then there's the federal system. In addition, Puerto Rico has its own court, and other territories have their own court. So when I say 52, that's actually an understatement of, of how many court systems there are. Obviously, in this course, we're going to be focusing on um, the federal system and the Texas system. So we won't be spending a lot of time talking about other jurisdictions. Just be aware that they aren't always like the Texas system or the federal system. Some of them have their own little twists and turns. Um, and then in addition to talking about the court system, we'll talk about how disputes get resolved when the parties decide not to go to court. So let's talk about the concept of um, jurisdiction. Um, this is a very, very complex topic. When you take federal civil litigation, there will be a long presentation on this topic. Um, and I'm going to touch upon it today, and I hope to be able to spend more time talking about it in class. I think it's one of those topics that uh, benefits from a live discussion of the issue. Let's talk, before we talk about jurisdiction, let's talk about some related concepts. One is the idea of standing to sue. I have standing as the plaintiff, I need to have standing as a plaintiff in order to sue. And what does it mean to have standing? It means that I have something at stake in the matter. I can't sue about someone else's problems. There's two reasons why I'm not permitted to sue over someone else's problems. The first is kind of a commonsensical one. We already have enough litigation in this country. We don't need people who don't really have a dispute electing to sue um, and, and being able to do so. The second reason is a little bit more subtle but is probably even more important, and that is the idea that if I'm suing about something that I really don't have um, a, a really strong um, personal connection to or a really strong basis for feeling that I'm going to benefit from this lawsuit, my level of interest, my level of zealousness, my attention to all the aspects of the lawsuit is going to be less than if I really had something at stake. As a result, assuming that the other side, the person whom I'm suing, has a lot at stake, he is going to be zealous. He's going to uncover every case, look for every fact, advance every argument. And I'm not. I don't care enough to do all those, those steps necessary. As a result, when cases are brought before the judge and the judge has to render a decision, the judge will hear one zealous advocate and one kind of so-so advocate. As a result, the judge is likely to to side with the Morzell's advocate because the Morzell's advocate has presented more powerful arguments. And it would be fine if the judge's decision affected only the two litigants before his court, but the reality that the decision this judge renders may create a precedent that's going to affect lots of other people, people who are zealous about their cases. So if you don't have two zealous advocates litigating a case, it can result in the establishment of bad precedents. And so that is the real basis for this concern about standing to sue. In addition, for there need, needing to be a standing, standing to sue, there also needs to be a justiciable controversy. It can't be a hypothetical controversy. A related term to this is the idea of ripeness. The, you look at standing, you look at justiciable controversy, and you look at ripeness. This is um, sometimes called uh, the case and controversy requirement. Um, with respect to justiciability, you're focusing on is there currently, right now, here today, a dispute that the court can resolve? Or is this something that might happen in the future? Imagine, for example, that um, I've entered into a contract with Bob, and um, I, the terms of the contract don't require me to do anything for several months. Um, where maybe Bob is preparing something that I'm going to, that's going to be delivered to me and I'm going to pay. During the time that I'm kind of waiting to perform, 
I may be exploring the idea of, is it really in my best interest to perform under this contract? Or perhaps would I be better served if I were to breach the contract? Um, but of course, if I breach the contract, it's very likely Bob's going to sue me, and uh, it's very likely he'll be successful suing me because, after all, I'm breaching the contract. So I'd want to know exactly what am I going to be expected to pay Bob if I breach the contract because it could be a good business decision. Maybe if I breach the contract and perhaps enter into another contract with someone else, I will get more benefit from the second contract than the amount of, of payment that I have to make to Bob. So it could be a, a logical business decision to breach the contract. But I may be uncertain as to what the court would award Bob if I were to breach the contract and he were to sue me. So I might like to get a preview. I might like to go to the court and say, Judge, tell me, if I breach this contract, tell me what I'm going to have to pay. And then I can decide whether to breach it or to go ahead go forward with the contract. Well, the judge isn't going to let me. He's not going to tell me what he's going to do. And again, there's a couple reasons for this. The first reason is that it's a hypothetical situation. He's a busy man. He's got lots of cases to deal with. He isn't going to feel that it's his job to... Um, show me all the different options that I might have available to me in my role as a sophisticated business person. That's one reason. But the second reason is that um, there really isn't a, a, a controversy at this point, and if I do what I'm supposed to do, there won't be a controversy. After all, I'm not supposed to breach my contract. It's not a crime, but um, the, the focus of my attention ought to be in complying with the terms of the contract. And so he doesn't want to aid me in violating the terms of a contract. So that's the idea of judiciable controversy. It has the controversy already has to exist. Um, let's talk briefly about the concept of jurisdiction. What is jurisdiction? Well, it's the authority of a court to hear a specific case. There are several different types of jurisdiction. The first type is jurisdiction over person, which is oftentimes called personal jurisdiction. Um, in that situation, um, a court has jurisdiction over the residents of a particular geographical area. So, for example, if I reside in the state of Texas, the courts in the state of Texas has jurisdiction over me. It's a given that that's going to be the case. Um, but that's not the limit of the jurisdiction of the uh, state courts in Texas. They have the ability to assert jurisdiction over people who are not residents of Texas. And the way that the courts would assert that jurisdiction is through a long-arm statute. Um, this is a state law that gives um, the state court the ability to assert jurisdiction over people and, and entities who have a sufficient number of contacts with that jurisdiction in order to meet that standard. Usually the standard is, is the corporation doing business within the state? So, for example, let's take the example of Walmart. Walmart is incorporated in the state of Delaware, and its principal place of business, its headquarters, is in Arkansas. And yet, I'm sure it has dozens of stores, probably more than dozens of stores in Texas, and employs probably thousands of people in Texas. It clearly is doing business within the state of Texas. So even though it's not a resident of Texas in the legal sense, the a state's long-arm statute will allow it to assert jurisdiction over Walmart because Walmart has sufficient minimum contacts with that jurisdiction. Um, under the uh, umbrella of personal jurisdiction, there are, is also the concept of uh, jurisdiction over property. This is called, um, let me type it out here, it's called in rem make that a little darker. There we go. In rem jurisdiction. In rem jurisdiction, uh, the, the word race, write that up here too. word race is the Latin word for thing. And um, rem is the declined um, version of the noun uh, race. So when we say jurisdiction about property, we're saying jurisdiction about the thing, and we call it in rem jurisdiction. Going back to this slide, when people talk about jurisdiction over persons, they usually use the term personal jurisdiction. But there's no term in English that is jurisdiction jurisdiction over things. We can't change it into single jurisdiction. There's no such word. And so we've kept the Latin expression, in rem jurisdiction. It's a type of personal jurisdiction. Obviously, things are not people. Land is not people. But it's a related concept um, uh, having to do with 
property within the borders of a state, the court has the ability, that state court has the ability to exercise jurisdiction over it. So imagine I own some land, or let's say some land exists in Oklahoma that there's a dispute about. Well, it's in the boundaries of the state of Oklahoma. So the court system there can exercise in rim jurisdiction over that land. Even if everybody who has a dispute about the land uh, lacks sufficient ties to the state of Oklahoma, um, so that there is no personal jurisdiction over the people who are asserting claims over that land. So that's an example about how in-room jurisdiction works. Again, it is a subcategory, that larger category of personal jurisdiction. Um, let me do some of my brilliant artwork here. Um, I'm going to draw a bucket here. I'm going to draw another bucket. Um, here we go. Imagine that this is the bucket for personal jurisdiction. And this is going to be our bucket for subject matter jurisdiction. In order for a court to exercise jurisdiction in a particular dispute, it has to have personal jurisdiction. And keep in mind, also included in this is in rem. So personal includes the category in rem as well as the more traditional personal jurisdiction, as well as subject matter jurisdiction. So, th so it's not an either or situation, it's an and. The court has to have both types. If it just has personal, it can't hear the lawsuit. If it just has subject matter, it can't hear the lawsuit. It has to have both types. Another thing to keep in mind about both subject matter and, and personal jurisdiction is that it's an on-off switch. Either you've got personal jurisdiction up until the top of the the bucket and you have subject matter jurisdiction up at the top of the bucket or you don't. You can't have a little bit of personal jurisdiction or a, a dab of subject matter jurisdiction. You either have it or you don't. So we talked about personal jurisdiction. So the person has to have ties to the, um, the state, um, typically either a resident or someone who regularly travels to the state or enacts business in that or engages in business in that state. Um, subject matter jurisdictions is a different issue. It's focusing on what the dispute is about. In fact, some people look at personal jurisdiction and think about it answering the question of who. Who can be sued in that state? And subject matter is focusing on what. What can this court hear? Another way to think about this is Personal jurisdiction has to do, if you think compare it to a play, it has to do with the cast of characters. Uh, whereas such a matter of jurisdiction has to do with the plot of the lawsuit. So let's look at some different ways to look at such a matter of jurisdiction. There's lots of different paradigms to think about. Um, one is some courts have what is called general jurisdiction and some courts have what is called limited jurisdiction. A court that has general jurisdiction I'm going to draw a little picture here. Oops, wait a second, that's not a very good one. I'm going to draw a picture over here. If we think about this circle as being the universe of everything you could sue about, general jurisdiction is the whole circle except for little carved out topics. Now, Texas doesn't have a lot of courts of limited jurisdiction, but let's imagine another state, and I'm going to pretend that this is the way Vermont courts are. I have no idea how they actually are. But it could be in Vermont they've got a family law court that just handles adoptions, child custody, divorces, annulments, things like that. And there may be another court in Vermont that just handles probate matters, handles uh, handling people's estates who've uh, died. And there might be another court system in Vermont that just handles juvenile disputes. Uh, when a juvenile has gotten in trouble with the law. And there might be another court in Vermont that handles tax issues. And that's all they do. So they've carved out these courts. Those example courts are called courts of limited jurisdiction. They cover one topic or one closely, several closely related topics. That's all they do. The idea behind having a court of limited jurisdiction is that court can have very specialized knowledge. The judge there is going to be an expert in family law or juvenile law or probate law or criminal law or whatever the topic is. 
Um, and so the, the judges who uh, hear those cases are going to be very, very familiar with the ins and outs of the law. There's that special, specialty um, notion. And then everything else that doesn't have a special court goes to the court of general jurisdiction. Obviously, most things are going to fall in this general jurisdiction. This is going to be where contract disputes are settled. This could be where most statutory issues are resolved. This is going to be where most tort-type claims, things like car accidents, are going to get resolved. Um, so most disputes are going to end up in a court of general jurisdiction. How can you tell whether a court is a court of general jurisdiction or a court of limited jurisdiction? Well, a big clue is with a court of limited jurisdiction, the name of the court is going to tell you. If it's called family court, the word right before a court tells you, hey, this doesn't handle just everything. It handles a specific category of things. A court of general jurisdiction should be described by some geographic notion. In Texas and in the federal system, these are called district courts, sometimes called county courts, if they happen to have a smaller amount uh, for jurisdictional purposes. You can see district suggests this is the, all the general jurisdictional cases that arise in a particular geographical area in this district are going to go to this court. So you can tell a court of limited jurisdiction describes the type that go in front of it, bankruptcy, family, tax, trade, those sorts of ideas, whereas the general jurisdiction, Robin, I'm going to leave with the word. So that's reading uh, subject matter jurisdiction into jurisdiction courts and limited jurisdiction courts. As you may have noticed, there are some state limited jurisdictional courts and there are some federal limited jurisdictional courts. For example, um, in the federal court system, there are tax courts. Those are courts of limited jurisdiction. There are bankruptcy courts. Those are courts of limited jurisdiction. There are international trade courts. Those are courts of limited jurisdiction. So you have limited jurisdiction both in the federal system and the state system. There's another way of dividing up courts uh, based upon subject matter jurisdiction. And one is courts of original jurisdiction and courts of appellate jurisdiction. Courts of original jurisdiction, the name suggests kind of what we're going to do here. And that is the idea. These are trial courts. These are the first place the plaintiff goes. See, by these, the word original. The first place. Before there's been any other action, action in this dispute, in the courtroom at least, you're going to go to these places. Appellate, obviously, are where you go for your appeals. You've already been to the court. Oh, here we go. To the court of original jurisdiction, you're not happy with what happened there. So you're going to go to a court for an appeal. So if you were to accidentally file your original lawsuit in appellate court, the court would say, we can't hear your case yet. Maybe we'll hear it after um, it goes through the trial. Um, similarly, if you, had, if you file your appeal in a court of original jurisdiction, the trial court will say, no, we don't have, handle those types of cases. So that's the distinction between original and appellate. Now let's talk about the, the meteor version of this. Um, let me get, erase the, those things. Let's talk about um, most of the time when you're talking about subject matter jurisdiction, what you're trying to do is you're trying to decide, am I going to file in state court or am I going to file in federal court, state or federal? That's the usual question that subject matter jurisdiction answers. Well, the general rule is that we file in a state court of general jurisdiction. Let me say that again because it's a really important concept. I'm going to call it the default rule. The default rule is that we file in a state court of general jurisdiction, not one of those limited jurisdiction courts. You need a special reason to go to a federal court. You need to be able to say something about the case that is a little bit unusual. Um, some of you may have heard the expression, don't make a federal case about it. If you've heard that expression and you didn't know what it means, let me explain. A, uh, the expression means that, or this, the, the term refers to the fact that um, uh, to make a federal case out of something means to make a big deal out of it. You need a special reasoning in a federal court. So if you're able to persuade the court to handle 
the federal court to handle your case, you've made a big deal about it. So when you say, don't make a federal case out of it, what you're saying is, don't make too big of a deal out of something. In other words, you have to work kind of hard to get into federal court. Let's look at the ways that you can get into federal court. Depending upon how you want to divide up the matters, there's usually most people think of them being five or six ways. The first way is you complain about, I'm going to erase these things here, you complain about the um, some violation of the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. Another way is you can complain that somebody has violated a U.S. treaty. Both of these make sense that you'd file these in federal court because, after all, the Constitu U.S. Constitution is a federal document. The U.S. treaty is entered into by the federal government, not by the states. So those make sense. The next one also makes sense. When the United States is a party, either the plaintiff or defendant, you have to go to federal court. It wouldn't make sense for us, the federal government to be bound by a decision made by a state court because, after all, the supremacy clause in the Constitution says that uh, the federal court system is, is or not, well, it doesn't say that, should the court, but, but the federal government is supreme over the states. So this one also makes sense that you have to go to federal court or you can go to federal court. Um, also, when two states sue each other, so if Texas, for example, were to sue Oklahoma about water rights, then those cases also go to federal court. Now, keep in mind this isn't the state of Texas suing an Oklahoman or a Tex the state of Texas suing a Texan. Those don't require that the case be filed in federal court. It's when one state is suing another state. And you can see why you go to the federal court system for that, because obviously if Texas is suing Oklahoma, Texas would love to sue Oklahoma in a Texas state court. After all, they'd get the home court advantage. Um, so the, the the option of going to federal court is a way to kind of diffuse a little bit of that home court advantage. So all of these kind of make sense as to why you can go to federal court over. The net, uh, but the, the first three, while they are certainly ways that you get into federal court, aren't nearly as uh, common to get into federal court as their next two. That's why I have these in, in bold. Uh, the next is a federal question. Federal question really means a federal statute is at issue. For some reason, it's not letting me write. I'm trying to write the word statute, but it's not. I must have used the wrong. Here we go. I'm going to just try to use the wrong marker here. Okay, so when you see federal question, it's a term of art. You'll help people use it all the time in these cases, but. It's really, uh, think of it as federal question, federal statute. So if I am suing about a federal statute, for example, um, Title VII, um, Civil Rights Act of 1964, that law will um, be a federal law, and so I can sue in federal court. So you can see, again, why, why you sue in federal court, because it's about a federal statute. That makes sense. And this is a, an important source of federal litigation. The cases end up in federal court. But the last one is probably the most prevalent way to get into federal court. And it doesn't make as much sense as the others. All the others, you can see because of what the lawsuit is about, where we said that such a marriage jurisdiction is about the plot of the lawsuit, it's what the subject of the lawsuit is. But this last category to go into federal court is not really about the facts of the lawsuit. Um, it, for diversity jurisdiction, what you look at is you look at the state citizenship of the plaintiff and the defendant. Now, the idea of state citizenship is a little bit surprising, perhaps, to you. We, uh, Those of us that are U.S. citizens know that we are citizens of the United States. But in order to be a U.S. citizen, you are also the citizen of one, but not more than one, state. Um, usually it's the state where you are currently living, but it's not always the state where you're currently living. For example, if you've just moved to Texas yesterday, you're probably still a citizen of the state where you moved from. Also, if you have been enlisted in the uh, military, you, are, you remain a citizen of the state where you enlisted. The reason for that is that once you become a member of the military, you no longer have uh, a choice about where you're going to live. And the idea of citizenship is that you, state citizenship is that you do have a choice. So if I enlist in the Army in Oklahoma and I am stationed in California, I have to move to California, but maybe I don't want to be a citizen of California. 
So for the purposes of my state citizenship, I will continue to be an Oklahoma citizen. Um, imagine a different scenario. Let's say that I was born in France to two parents who are French citizens. And my my parents and I moved to, the, to Texas, to the United States, when I'm three days old. So I grew up in the United States. I speak English without any accent. Um, I am a, a cultural product of Texas in the United States. Um, but I never seek American citizenship, U.S. citizenship. Um, so under those situations, I'm a resident of Texas. But even though I've lived for decades in the state of Texas, I can't be a citizen of the state of Texas. Because in order to be a citizen of the state of Texas, I have to be a a citizen of the United States. Okay, so that's what state citizenship is about. So we're going to be talking about state citizenship. Now, this can get confusing when we compare it to, I'm going to flip back here for a second, compare it to personal jurisdiction. When we talk about personal jurisdiction, a pers- uh, many, many different states can have jurisdiction over one person. Um, I might own some property in Oklahoma. I might routinely go to Nevada for business. I might have just moved away from Massachusetts a year ago and, and maintain lots of contacts there. Um, I might have business clients that I call on in Oklahoma, I mean in Ohio. So there might be several states in addition to Texas, my state of residency, that can exercise personal jurisdiction over me. But when we're talking about citizenship, we just have one citizenship. So when we're looking at diversity uh, diversity jurisdiction, we're going to look at the state citizenship. And the usual way to do this is to do a T chart. And we'll put the plaintiff here and the defendant here. And then you list all of your plaintiffs. Um, we'll say plaintiff A, plaintiff B, plaintiff C. And maybe there's D, E, and F on the defense side. And then you'd list their state citizenship. Maybe A is a citizen of Texas. Maybe B is a citizen of Oklahoma. Maybe D is a citizen of Michigan. And E is a citizen of New Mexico. Well, you can see from these choices that there is no repeat. There is Texas appears only once. Oklahoma appears only once. Michigan appears only once. And New Mexico appears only once. Let's imagine that C is also a citizen of Michigan. I'm not like I'm sorry. Let's make C a citizen of Texas. Make it a little easier. You have not defeated diversity jurisdiction by having a state repeat on one side. So it's fine if there's 50 Texans as long as they're all plaintiffs, and it's fine if if um, F is from New Mexico, is a citizen of New Mexico. It's fine if there's 50 New Mexicans on this side, as long as they're just on one side. Well, let's say D decides to join the lawsuit. I'm running out of space here. Just imagine that's a D. And D is from Michigan. Well, we have a Michigan on the defense side and a Michigan on the plaintiff side. That destroys diversity. It doesn't matter if there's 100 other plaintiffs and 100 other defendants, and this is the only one, only time that you have um, a state appear on more than one side. One time defeats diversity completely. So that's how you uh, establish diversity. Um, another factor is let's say that the plaintiffs want to sue a corporation. We'll call the corporation G Corporation. Corporations are different than human beings in terms of their citizenship. I mean, in some sense, they're not citizens of any jurisdiction. But we kind of pretend that they're citizens of potentially two places. The first is their state of incorporation. Let's go back to Walmart. Walmart is incorporated in Delaware. But its principal place of business, its brain center, it's where um, the executives of Walmart live and uh, perform corporate functions, are in uh, Arkansas. So for the purposes of citizenship for this diversity analysis, we consider Walmart to be a citizen of two states, Delaware and Arkansas. Now, many times corporations are incorporated in the same state where they have their principal place of business. In that situation, they would just be citizens of only one state for the purposes of diversity. But let's say that this corporation is a citizen of Texas and Delaware. Well, 
either one of these can cause a diversity problem. And we can see this causes a diversity problem. Corporation G, its ties to Texas, and A's ties to Texas defeat diversity. So you just need one problem in diversity analysis to render the lack of diversity. There's another requirement for diversity jurisdiction that we haven't talked about, and that is that the amount in controversy has to be over 75,000. So it has to be 75,000 and at least one penny. Uh, if, I, if A sues all these people for $75,000 even, there is not sufficient uh, amount in controversy for diversity jurisdiction to exist. The dollar amount exists only for diversity. Any of these other categories, you can sue for 10 cents and still have the federal court's consent jurisdiction. Now let's look at the issue of exclusive or concursive juris con excuse me, concurrent jurisdiction. Um, you see I put in parentheses whether concurrent exists or exclusive exists. The way I like to remember this is imagine that you're dating somebody and they tell you that they are your exclusive significant other. Well, you understand that to mean they're not going to date other people. But if they tell you that they are, uh, your relationship is a concurrent relationship, will be very suspicious because that means they are, are preserving their options. They can date around. And that's how this um, plays out with with a jurisdiction. If I'm if I'm the plaintiff and I'm suing about the U.S. Constitution, I can file in federal court. I have that option. But because concurrent jurisdiction exists, I can also file in state court. That actually makes pretty good sense because, after all, the states are the people who have created the Constitution. So it makes sense. Even though it's a federal document, it's a state-created federal document. So you can pursue those rights both in state or federal court. Concurrent exists. But exclusive jurisdiction exists only for um, treaty disputes. Again, that makes sense because states aren't involved in establishing treaties at all. Similarly, when the U.S. party, USA is a party or when two states are suing each other, you have to file in federal court. They have exclusive jurisdiction. Um, when you have a federal statute at issue or federal question, it depends. You have to actually look at the statute. Sometimes the statute will give a concurrent jurisdiction that the plaintiff can sue in either state or federal court. Sometimes it will be exclusive jurisdiction. The statute will say the plaintiff has to file in federal court. Diversity jurisdiction is one of these areas that there is concurrent jurisdiction. Even when there is complete diversity and the amount of controversy is over 75000 the plaintiff can still elect to file his lawsuit in state court. So that's what exclusive and concurrent means. And this is a little map showing you how exclusive and concurrent work kind of in a a visual manner, and you can see exclusive is where you could, in the, the blue is where you can file in federal court exclusively, and then the yellow is where you file in state court exclusively. Concurrent is where you can file um, both. The, the plaintiff has a choose, choice of whether to file in one place or the other. Um, let's talk about venue. Venue sounds like, when I talk about it, I haven't yet explained what it is, but when I tell you about it, it's going to sound suspiciously like jurisdiction. Let's say this is one of the most common points of confusion for um, uh, law students and paralegal students. Venue is related to the idea of jurisdiction, but it is also very much distinct. Venue is not a type of jurisdiction. You can only determine venue after you have looked at personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction will tell you which state you can sue in if you're the plaintiff. And subject matter jurisdiction will tell you whether you, within that state whether you're going to file in state court or federal court. So imagine that I determine through my personal jurisdiction analysis that I need to file my lawsuit in Florida. And then I look at my subject matter jurisdictional analysis and decide, oh, well, I need to file it in federal court. So I know where I need to go, federal court in Florida. Um, so you have to make that analysis before you can even think about venue. Now that I've decided I'm going to file in federal court in Florida, now I have to pick the part the particular area of Florida where I can file. Remember we said before that jurisdiction is an on-off switch. Even though our dispute may deal completely, let's change it to Texas so we can have geographical um, areas. Uh, let's say that, that our dispute, everything that happened in our dispute happened in Texarkana. 
um, everybody in the story lives in Texarkana. The, the the cause of action, the dispute that we have, arose in Texarkana, and uh, so we decided we're going to file in, we'll say, Texas state court. Texas has jurisdiction. The state courts have subject matter jurisdiction. Um, every single county in Texas would have jurisdiction. It's an on-off switch. If one county has jurisdiction, they all do. But not all those counties would be appropriate for venue. Um, you have to look for the most appropriate location for trial. Um, there are uh, three rules to apply venue. The first is when you're the plaintiff, you, of course the plaintiff is the one who chooses where to file the lawsuit, you look at all of your defendants and you look at the counties in which they reside. Um, and let's say you, your plaintiff, your, it's me, your defendant number one lives in Collin County. And defendant number two, we'll say, lives in Harris County. And defendant number three, we'll say, lives in Denton County. Well, the plaintiff can choose any of these three counties to file a lawsuit. Let's say there's 50 people the plaintiff is suing and 48 of them all live in Denton County. Only one lives in Collin County, only one lives in Harris County. Plaintiff can still pick any one of these three counties that is most convenient for him or her. So that is where the parties reside, where the defendants reside. The other uh, rule that plaintiffs can do, let's say plaintiffs don't like these, the plaintiff doesn't like either any of these three counties. Plaintiff can also file where the relevant act occurred. Let's say it's the car accident case. So let's say the car accident actually happened in Tarrant County. Well, that's a third place that the uh, plaintiff can file, even though nobody, none of the defendants live in Tarrant County because the cause of action, the car accident in this case, arose, then the um, plaintiff can file a lawsuit there. Let's uh, assume, though, that the plaintiff wants to sue somebody who doesn't live in Texas. Well, if they don't live in Texas, they obviously don't live in a Texas county. And let's say the uh, cause of action about which the plaintiff is suing didn't happen in Texas. Now, obviously, for this matter to be filed in a Texas state court, um, the plaintiff has to, excuse me, the defendant has to have sufficient ties with Texas, but it doesn't have to be a resident of Texas. So there's no county where any of the defendants live and no ca the cause of action didn't arise. Since these first these two categories are the null set, the plaintiff can choose any county in Texas where he wants to file his lawsuit. So venue is a choice between places that already have jurisdiction. That's the takeaway with that. So it's important to have a clear distinction in your mind between what venue is and what jurisdiction is. Uh, judicial procedures. There are two sets, obviously, because we have a federal system. We have the federal rules of civil procedure, and we also have the Texas or the state rules of civil procedure. Um, and then, of course, we have the federal rules of criminal procedure and the state rules of criminal procedure. This, these are the rule books, kind of like when you play um, uh, or when you, you play, say, football or something. You have to know how many downs you get, how many yards qualify as a down. Um, yeah, how many points you get when you uh, get a touchdown, how many points are for a field goal, all those things, you go to the rule book. And once you look at the rule book, then you can develop strategies. If a field goal earned you as many points as a touchdown, you can bet there'd be a lot more field goals and a lot fewer touchdowns because people would adjust their strategies to reflect um, the, the relative ease and the number of points you get with each approach. Similarly, with the uh, rules of civil procedure and criminal procedure, the litigants and the attorneys look at these rules and decide how to strategically use these rules to their advancement of their clients' interests. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about our state court system. Um, in Texas, as in most states, judges are elected for a particular term, four years. Um, once a judge is elected, he, if he's a trial court judge, he's going to preside over a court. He will be the only judge in that court. Um, if the trial that he is um, overseeing is a jury trial, then there will be a jury that will decide issues of fact. But the judge will always decide issues of law. For example, the judge will make evidentiary rulings. 
um, whether a certain piece of evidence is admissible or whether um, a certain objection is going to be sustained or overruled. Similarly, the judge will give legal instructions to the jury about how to consider the um, evidence, how to apply the facts as the jury has determined them to the law. But sometimes there can be non-jury trials. Many times these are called bench trials, where the judge acts as both the finder of law, um, which he always does, as well as a finder of fact, which he doesn't do when there's a jury. During the trial, attorneys will present evidence. They will do this typically through witnesses, through the witness's testimony, but they also may put uh, documents and exhibits into evidence. Again, they'll still do that through a witness, but they may put in physical uh, documents or physical exhibits uh, for the jury's consideration. After an attorney has presented a particular witness, then the other side, the other attorney, gets to cross-examine that witness. Typically, the role, role here for the cross-examining attorney is to challenge credibility or memory or some aspect of the witness's testimony uh, to make the jury hopefully conclude that it is less credible than they might have otherwise thought. As I said before, the jury decides facts. The judge um, decides the law, and the judge will issue a final judgment. We already talked about courts of general and limited jurisdiction. Here's some examples. We don't actually have these in Texas, but we do have small claims courts, JP courts. Um, but, but these are some in some other states you'll find. Family law court, probate court, small claims court, which we call JP courts. Also, um, federal courts. By the way, for our small claims courts, the jurisdictional amount in Texas is $10,000. So any dispute under $10,000 will go to small claims or JP court. The federal court system has bankruptcy courts tax courts. Those are courts of limited jurisdiction. Now let's talk about what happens. We were talking about courts of original jurisdiction here. So there's trial courts, or courts of original jurisdiction. Now we're going to go to court, appellate courts. Um, these are courts who review what happens in that original court, in that trial court. Notice that the word appellate ends with the A-T-E-8. We'll talk about appellants, A-N-T, in a second, but now we're talking about appellate. eight. Many times when people say appellate and appellant, the sound difference is very subtle. And so if you're not listening carefully or the person isn't being careful, they may sound very, very much the same and they have a very important distinction in meaning. So before you go to the appellate court, obviously you have to have had a resolution to your case in um, the trial court. And after the trial is done and a judgment issues, one side, sometimes both sides, are unhappy with the decision. And so what they are going to do under those circumstances many times is appeal the decision. But let me put a point of clarification here. Only about 10% of all cases are appealed. And of those 10% that are appealed, only about 10% are overturned. So really, it's only about 1% of the time that when a trial judge, trial court decision that emanates from that trial court will be overturned, only about 1% of the time. So. Um, the appellate system is important uh, primarily probably for establishing precedents, for right? getting getting stare decisis going to have that uh, common law system. Uh, but as a practical matter, it, it rarely actually results in a change from what happens at the trial court level. So, but let's imagine that you are, you're one of those 10% cases that you're going to appeal. And what are you looking for? What kind of claims are you going to present to that appellate court in the hopes that the appellate court will uh, reverse, overturn, uh, vacate, whatever the particular legal theory is, of what happened at the trial court. What you're looking for is a reversible error, something that the trial court did that was really, really bad. And there are two things that you need here. The first thing you need is an error. Um, the reality is, as much as judges might like to think of themselves as perfect, um, they are just one person presiding over trial, and they're making evidentiary here, rulings very, very quickly. They're not going to get every one of them right. Um, you know, a good baseball player might bat 300, uh, which means if they miss the ball 700 times for, um, you know, uh, 700 times for every 300 that they they actually um, hit. Well, you want a, a judge to have a better batting average than that, but you wouldn't expect him to be batting a 1,000. That's not realistic. There's going to be errors made because the judge is a human being. Just the fact that errors are made, though, don't, does not mean that the trial court decision will be overturned because in addition, 
for the need for error, the error has to be significant enough that if the judge had gotten the ruling right, it would have affected the outcome of the case. So it has to be a big error. It has to be a reversible error. And the bottom line is the appellate court shows great deference to the trial court's findings of fact. So this isn't something that the appellate court routinely does. Certainly does it when it's necessary, but is um, inclined to uphold what the trial court does. The appellate system typically has two levels. We have two levels in Texas, um, and uh, the federal system has two levels. A few less populous states only have one level, but usually they have two. There's the intermediate appellate courts, which are typically called courts of appeal. That's what they're called in Texas. And then we have our highest state courts. Um, Texas is a little bit unusual in that we have um, two highest courts. Um, our highest court for civil matters is the Texas Supreme Court. Our highest matter for criminal matters is the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Now, the terminology kind of suggests that um, the uh, – actually, let me show you here. This is, by the way, just a generic picture. Well, let me flip here and show you what the Texas system actually looks like. Um, when you hear these names, you might think that somehow or another this isn't as, as high a court as this, but really it is. If a case goes here, it's not ever going to go over here. If a case goes here, it's never going over there. The district courts handle both civil and criminal matters. Courts of appeal handle civil and criminal matters. It's only at this level, at the highest court, that there's that bifurcation. I also note in here that there are county-level courts, municipal courts, and justice courts, the ones that have the $10,000 jurisdictional amount. Um, to be a district court, you have to be suing for a pretty significant amount of money in Texas. So let's look at the federal court system. Here's a picture, of, or actually we don't have a picture yet, but we do have the um, information about how the federal court system works. Um, judges are appointed for life by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The only way that they get out of office is if they retire, resign, or they are impeached. Not a very common thing. We have that same three-tier model in the federal system that we do in the states. We have the U.S. district courts, which have basically the same role as the Texas district courts. They're trial courts. They have original jurisdiction in matters of federal law. There's at least one U.S. district court in every state. Texas has four. There's no state that has more than four. When I say that there are four district courts in Texas, I don't mean there's only four courthouses. Uh, there's actually dozens of courthouses, federal courthouses, um, but there's four districts. So, for example, in the Eastern District, which is where Collin County is, we have an, uh, uh, a courthouse in Plano. There's also one in Sherman. There's also one in Texarkana and Tyler and uh, several other places. So, um, they're, they're, um, this is the district, but they might say Sherman Division to reflect the particular courthouse that they're from. You don't need to know where the border lines are between these districts. But you do need to know that Collin County is in the Eastern District and Dallas County is in the Northern District. Um, the U.S. Courts of Appeal are oftentimes called circuit courts. So in Texas, we call our mid-level or our mid-mid-level uh, appellate court. We call it also a court of appeal. We don't call it a circuit court. There are 13 circuits in the um, federal system. Um, Eleven of them are numbered. And so we have the first first circuit all the way to the eleventh circuit. Um, we Texas are actually in the fifth circuit, and we are in the fifth circuit along with Louisiana and Mississippi. You need to know this fact. You will be seeing this again. Hint, hint. Um, most of the time, decisions are going to be final, whether whether we're in the federal system or the state system. Everyone has an automatic right of appeal up to a court of appeal. If you're in the state system, it would be to a Texas court of appeal. If you're in the federal system, it would be a U.S. court of appeal. Those courts have to hear your case. If you pay the money and um, you file the brief, they're going to hear your case. They may not spend a lot of time on it if it's a silly uh, case in their minds, but they are going to have to hear, let you hear the case. But the highest courts, the U.S. Supreme Court, the Texas Supreme Court, the Texas Court of appeal, Criminal Appeals, does not have to hear your course. It's discretionary. And so you will get at least one appeal, but you may not get any more. If your argument for appealing to the highest court in that particular jurisdiction is weak, the court's probably not going to grant it. Let's talk about the U.S. Supreme Court. There are nine justices, one of those being the chief justice. 
and they review cases both from the Federal Court of Appeals and from the State Court of Appeals, or the State Supreme Court, you know, actually it's from the highest court, highest appellate court in the particular state. So in Texas, it would be the Texas Supreme Court or the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. The mechanism that the U.S. Supreme Court uses to hear cases is usually a writ of certiorari. A writ of certiorari, sometimes called a writ of certiorari, um, is a, a writ. And let's first of all talk about what a writ is. A writ is a court order, and uh, this is a particular type of court order. It, it, a writ of certiorari would be sent to the lower court saying, send up your file. That's what it does. It's not a very glamorous thing. Many times people will call it a cert petition, the request for a writ of certiorari. Let me explain what the rule of four is. Um, there are nine justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. Only, however, four of those justices have to decide to hear a particular case. And they can each decide to hear it for a different reason. They don't necessarily share the same ideological perspective. They all just have to say, yeah, we think this is a good thing for us to hear. Um, they may be doing it to resolve a constitutional law issue, something that obviously the U.S. Supreme Court is focused on. They're much more interested in resolving a constitutional issue than just a statutory issue, although they take on lots of statutory issues as well. Uh, another big concern they have is when there's this conflict between the circuits. Um, let me go ahead to this slide. This gives you a view of our circuits. Here's the Fifth Circuit. You can see Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. If the Ninth Circuit issues a ruling that says um, the Constitution says X and the Eleventh Circuit says no, it says something different, then that means that the U.S. Constitution has a different meaning in one part of the country versus another part of the country. You can see, well, that's not a very good idea. So that would be a case that the uh, Supreme Court would be very interested in resolving. And so very likely in that situation. Uh, four or more justices would say, we need to hear that case to resolve this dispute, to tell the, our whole nation what that particular rule is. Again, here's a schema about uh, how our federal system looks. This is a little bit misleading because um, this is where the vast, vast majority of the courts are. Yes, there's plenty of U.S. bankruptcy courts, but a lot fewer than U.S. district courts. And yes, there's plenty of U.S. Uh, trial courts, uh, tax courts, I'm sorry, but a lot fewer than U.S. district courts. Um, but this is a much smaller element. So if you were to, to, to scale them up to size, this would be a much bigger um, category than the others. I forgot to say one thing when we were up here. I said that there were 13 circuits, and I said 11 were numbered, um, 1 through 11, but there's two more. And one is, and you'll see it here, is the D.C. Circuit. The District of Columbia is the 12th. Then you have the Federal Circuit. That's the 13th. So that covers all the circuits. So for this map, what do you need to know? You need to know the Fifth Circuit, the three states in it. And you need to know that Collin County is in the Eastern District and um, Dallas County is in the Northern District. It's counterintuitive because obviously Collin County is north of Dallas County. But that, even though that's the case, you see, see it's right um, here where, where we have this little glitch here that, that the Eastern District is actually north of the Northern District. I'm going to end this uh, Wimba lecture at this time, and I will start another Wimba lecture pretty soon covering the topic of alternative dispute resolution. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, be sure to bring those to class. I look forward to discussing them with you. Or, of course, you can always come to my office hours. Again, thanks, and I'll be seeing you in class.